genetic crops. I like PowerPoint because I like to show pictures. You won't have a lot to read on the screen, I know. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi, John. My name is John Mayer. I'm the executive director of Cali, the Center for Computer System Legal Instruction. Um, really glad to be here. And um, Ron, you were too kind. Um, I don't know that you've been following me for 20 years or I've been following you. I guess it's just a circle. Um, Right. So, so Cali is a uh, nonprofit consortium of law schools. I get my money from mostly from law schools. Uh, 211 law schools are members of Cali. We're, you know, I'm not even going to talk about the thing and, uh, that we're most known for, which is our Cali lessons. There's over 800 of them that were used over almost a million times this last year by law students around the country, 30 different subject areas. You can go to the website and find out more about that. No, what I want to talk about is case books. Sorry. I hope it's not going to be that boring because I think there's something exciting to this crowd and to and, and about the future of casebooks because uh, because there it is an exciting casebook. Now I've stripped off all identifying information so as not to appear to favor or or to the same particular publisher. But really, what the future of casebooks is is uh, well, I, I brought some casebook readers with me, and I actually I discovered that um, I've got five of them. So I've got my Kindle here, which I can uh, use to read uh, books on. I've got my iPad, um, with the best app on here being um, the uh, Alice in Wonderland app. Because you know, it not only lets you read, but it also has a, uh, you know, interactive elements to it. You know, little swinging watches and stuff like that. Um, just received yesterday my, my Edge, my Entourage, Edge, which I understand the, um, which actually has an Android on one side and a Kindle on the other side. And I think Pepperdine is going to give these out to all their one L's next fall. No kidding. Um, I don't know anything about that. Let me think. Oh, I've got a uh, half a dozen book readers on my uh, my phone. You know, and of course, the fifth one. I've got my laptop, which itself is a reader, right? So this is the future, supposedly, of case books or of books, right? It's Kindles, it's iPads or G pads. It's uh, iPhones or, or Androids, it's also laptops, you know, and it's also this, it's your iPod. Because if you've got a case book or if you've got a book that's in a digital format, well, it's easy to turn it into something that can be listened to. At least it should be, if that information is available to you for you to turn it into, or if the publisher has provided it, right? This is also case books, and I put that up there because it's perfect bound, because it might have come from a, a, a print on demand like a Lugu, which is in which you can get extremely cheap printing done, or or in some cases it might be coming from one of these machines. That's an Espresso print-on-demand machine where you're going to start seeing those in not in Barnes and Noble. I don't think they're going to do it. I think Borders though was looking at this, where you go up, you say I want to buy this book, and out comes something you know bound in five minutes or something like that. Now of course, why would you want a a book in paper? Well, because paper is an interface, right? This is also a book, it's a blog, right? In other words, you could publish your book on WordPress with the idea that collaboration would be easier. So you read on there and you can comment and other people can comment. And this is where we start to get out past the idea of just a simple book. Now, we have to talk about it as a book or as a case book because that's what law faculty and law students are familiar with. But I expect that very quickly we're going to get away from that. We're going to start being very confused about what it means to be a book because it's, it's a social artifact. It's got a built-in social group, which is the class that takes it, and all the classes that take it, and all the people that are, that are interested in that topic area. All right? So the book would also be able to, if we were on a blog, at least in this case, for this article, uh, portable to different devices. Because I've got a Kindle, and I've bought some books but Kindle's got something called WhisperSync. And so sometimes when I forget to bring this, I can grab my iPad, which has got a Kindle for iPad app. And I've actually sat there, just because I'm, uh, I like to do this, you know, and sat there and read a few pages and then put that down and pick this up and open the same book. And it says, oh, I noticed that you've moved ahead a few pages on your other 
thing. Do you want to sink? I'm like, I sure do. And then I pull that out. And I say, well, let's do uh, this. And both of them beat back at me. Okay, okay, that's too much fun, right? Um, it's not that that's just funny. It's also that that's an amazingly powerful thing. Because as a, as a, as a geek, I realize, huh, there's a communication system there. There's a network underneath there. There's a, there's a way to send other information besides the mere updating of what's the next page that I'm on. There could be all sorts of things. As I highlight things, you know, it could be telling my other devices, here's the highlights that you put on that device. And as long as it's in the internet, sorry, as long as it's in the network, you know, why does it just have to tell me? Why can't it tell everybody? Why can't I have a social network around the book? Richard Daly, every year or, or every few months, actually, I don't even know what he's done lately, but Chicago used to have uh, uh, one book per, uh, what was it even called? Everybody reads the same book or something like that. You know, how cool would it be if we could be commenting on it while we're reading it and seeing each other's comments or something like that? All right, maybe that's stupid or crazy or not that compelling. But if you're all in the class together, maybe you want to share notes. Or maybe you want to see the notes that the professor has laid there for you, like little landmines for you to find as you progress in that book. All right? This is another book. Now, this is a uh, common press. It's a plugin for WordPress. And the idea here is the book is up on the left, and on the right is a collection of comments that are linked into particular paragraphs or to pages or to the entire book itself. In other words, you can sort of comment at different hierarchical levels. So if the material of the book, the data of the book, is able to be put into WordPress, then it can be put into this model where you could have an entire planet of people all commenting on the same thing. Think slash shop for books or think, you know, any of those sorts of ideas. Um, maybe on that big scale it doesn't make much sense, but if you, if you think of this down onto everybody who teaches a class has a blog that has the book in the blog, and alternatively, available on Kindles because some of the students are going to buy Kindles and on iPads because some of the students are going to buy iPads. Not everybody's going to buy all the same thing. That's a problem, right? But if the data underneath it is in a compatible and open format, then some of these possibilities can occur. This is the sort of the ultimate version of that, Wikibooks, where uh, it's, a, it's up on the web, it's open content textbooks, and anyone can edit it. Now that's really scary, right? You don't want just anyone to edit your textbook. Well, think of this as the ability that anyone can edit it, but it's a series of forks. So if at a point in time you want to teach from a book, you can freeze that copy. And you don't have to accept anybody else's additional edits or something like that. You know, some faculty think that a wiki is something that gets changed all the time. You know, JFK was assassinated by Martin Luther King, and so I don't want to be teaching that, you know, only the Texans want to teach those types of things. So, you know, there has to be the ability to go back to an authenticated or a, you know, a canonical copy of the book, which has to remain static for at least the three months that the class is being taught. And actually, maybe forever, because ten years from now, you might be want to say, you know, I want to look something up that was in, that I took in the class, and if it was a book that I was pulling off a shelf, well, it's the same book, but if it's an electronic copy, you wouldn't want it to have been changed in that midtime. In the meantime. Now, unfortunately, this is what you are at present getting from most publishers when they say ebooks. Now, it's not always a PDF, a lot of time, but it almost always is something that's going to be locked down. And I totally understand that. If it is something that was in an open access format, well, then they would sell one copy and then a million, you know, and, then, and the, that would just be shared a la Napster or something like that. But the rest of my talk is basically to argue that although that's a problem for the publishers, it's we got to find a solution because otherwise we're not going to be able to innovate in the ways that we want in education, and that's very important. So let's look at this. So here's our casebook, and the casebook is made up of lots of pieces. I've only pulled out a few cases, some analysis, some problems, some articles. Um, certainly, those cases should be free and open, and, you know, so that a faculty member who wanted to assemble their own casebook could. Well. Three, four years ago, I was walking around at everybody and everybody trying to find a collection of cases that I could put into a database so that I could say to faculty, come build your own case books. It was very hard to find. No, it was impossible. I wasn't able to do it. All right? The reason why we're looking at case books, of course, is because it's Christopher Columbus laying down. 
But the name of the project is Elaindell because uh, you know we want to update his idea that faculty would construct their own casebooks for their students. All right, so let me tell you about this. So here's the idea. All faculty are constructing their own books, but they're not going to construct them individually. They're going to share into a larger database. There would be this universe of, of faculty all contributing to the same thing. Of course, this is a digital database. And they're creating digital books because from the digital books, you can go to multiple devices or to a paper device. And what would students think? Well, students would say, cool. And the main reason, and I've, and I've sat in lots of conversations, and I've read every article I could find about student reactions to pilot projects and things, and the number one reason why students want electronic books is, what do you think? Wait. It's wait. They want to lighten their, their backpacks. I mean, it always shows up on all the comments. Look, I'll pay the money, just you know, make it lighter for me or something like that. Um, cash certainly comes up, I think, three or four. The other thing is you can't lose an electronic book, right, because you can always get another copy of it. You can search a book, I just use Google as a verb there, I should maybe use a small g. Um, you can highlight it because, of course, students must turn things yellow. Um, but those highlights would be e-highlights because then maybe I could share them from my Kindle up to my WhisperNet to other people who are on the blog reading the book through some other format. All right, And those are searchable, and of course it would be cheaper. Hopefully, you gotta hope that this would result in some savings along the lines. So now why would faculty want to be involved in anything like this? Right? How do I convince them? Well, it's a chicken and egg problem, actually. And so for that, and we passed around some of the things, we're offering, Kelly's offering essentially a stimulus project. We will pay faculty $500 to write a chapter. Now, I think this is a mistake. I think, I think we messed up. Because I was already thinking ahead that what I want to do is disaggregate the book down into chunks. And I wanted to know, and I wanted to do what Linus did with Linux. I wanted to make, I wanted to offer to the community the ability to create or to contribute to the project in small enough pieces. If you ask somebody to write a book, they'll say, sure, I'll be back in a couple of years. It takes a long time. If you ask them to write a chapter, well, you might get something in a month or two or something like that. Right? And so that's where I set the price point for that. I said five hundred dollars a book. But it turns out that $500 doesn't excite people. Um, it also doesn't solve a problem for them, really. I mean, I thought it might because, because my definition of a chapter is the amount of reading material that a student has to do to prepare for one course, sorry, one class. So a 16-week course, meeting three times a week for an hour, that would be 48 classes. Which means I'm willing to give people $24,000. Now, maybe not all those classes will have reading material, but actually $20,000 or something like that to write a book, right? So that's out there right now. Where this is going to gonna mail that or something similar to that to every law faculty in the country next week. Um, and we've been talking it up a little bit in places. We, I expected this flood, and so I wanted to just sort of whisper it and see if it would go viral. And what's the opposite of that, right? When you whisper it, nobody listens. <laughs> it's, it's dead. Yeah. <laughs> no virus there. Don't worry. <clears throat> okay. So that's where we're at. <clears throat> of course, we're going to take that material and stick it into a commons. I mean, that $20,000, I'm going to buy the copyright. Now, I don't want to keep the copyright myself. I want to turn it, I want to uh, assign a uh, Creative Commons to it, a uh, license, so that I can turn around and give it away. But I got to get the copyright out of the person, and we are hoping that $20,000 is a sufficient amount of money. I believe it to be more than most, more than what most. Uh, Casebook authors get now. I doubt most casebook authors make twenty thousand dollars off their book. Right now, it's not just money, and it's not just it's the the, the, the big the big uh, what's the word currency in this space is not money. It's actually the uh, reputational points you get for having been published. Um, and the third thing is the ability to teach exactly what you want, because no book ever matches exactly what you want to teach. Um, but that's the point, you write your own book, all right? So this is about free, we would give these books away free to students, but it's really about freedom to innovate in education. At least that's our goal, all right? There's a little bit slow there. We would expect that there would be groups of faculty that might get together, maybe they're not gonna, one person's gonna collect that 20 grand, they're gonna get two or three of them together and form a team or a law firm or you know, a list of people on the, on the book. 
So a bunch of people that have a particular way of teaching torts that's different from the other 25 torts books that are out there, or labor law, or dog law, or something special. As a matter of fact, it's in the dog law weird areas where there is no good case book, or where it's too, or the area is changing too fast, cyber law should be ideal. Right? Um, international law should be good, comparative law, things that are like the law and courses. I mean, all sorts of, we, we can imagine all sorts of use cases where this would make some sense. The Carnegie Report says that legal education has to change. And if legal education has to change, that means the materials that are being used in legal education have to change. And if we wait for the publishing cycle to catch up, which is a 12 to 24 month cycle, then we're going to have to basically only change, well, it's too late to change this year, we've got to wait 12 months. Oh, we've got this great idea, a whole new curriculum, we need a whole new set of books, it'll be three years before they're ready. Well, if the books are electronic and open access, we'll be ready as soon as they're written because basically writing is publishing in this new medium, right? There's also, I, I've talked to a lot of faculty who've been going on trips to China. Uh, Mary Rose Truby just got back from uh, Bangkok, got out of there alive. Um, and uh, some of the conversations I've had with them are, is we're trying to teach others about the American law system, but our books that we would use to teach our students are inadequate because of cultural problems, because we don't want to teach them the same things. We basically want to take the book and pare it down and then add some other things to it. There's just a whole different educational approach. Well, if it's a DRM'd paper book, they can't do that. If it's an open access digital file, then they can do that. And they can even experiment and iterate on how to do that, all right? American Bar Association section on legal education has been pressuring or is coming out with a report soon about outcomes. They would like law schools to measure whether they are succeeding in their teaching. I'm not going to laugh. Um, that's a good thing that law schools would measure that. But uh, obviously that would mean maybe they would change the way you teach in order to improve the teaching. So that would be a statistic that would be, you know, you're trying to make go up. And that would necessitate a change in materials. All right? We are only as nimble or capable of change or incorporating change as the materials that we use. And so if those materials are DRM, that's going to be a problem. All right? So I thought this was a great idea. But the ghost of um, Elangel, however, contacted us and sent us this uh, video because uh, he wasn't too happy with this. Now, I'm not sure I can maybe get the sound out of this. Let me try. doesn't just apply to case books, right? It applies to anything that might be involved in legal education as a material. So code books, statute books, uh, CLE materials, uh, books written for the public, for paralegal programs, for criminal justice programs, things like that. Um, I noticed uh, building codes was mentioned half a dozen times, and so I decided to look that up on about, yes, I can go buy the, the 2009 Chicago building code for $329 if I want to. Um, it, it is online, by the way. Chicago Building Code is finally online. It's a, it's a little hard to find, though. i got to admit, right? So in conclusion, let me wrap this up with the following. Everyone is a citizen. Everybody can agree with that, right? 
And as we found uh, from uh, what uh, Professor Stott was saying, you know, everyone therefore is a lawyer. Because every citizen can be, represent themselves in the court of law, and unfortunately sometimes do, right? That means everyone is also a law student, all right? And so open access to the law, well that's just the beginning then of legal education for everyone. So we've got to start there before we can go on to greater things. You know, and so let's get her done so that that can happen. All right, I'm done. John, that, uh, that was really a very creative and engaging uh, understanding of where you're headed. But um, in a way, you're, you're um, creating we're arguing for the creation of a book or an e-book uh, that basically replicates books today. <laughs> it's just text. Where, where, are the, <laughs> where are the features that make it engaging? Where are the graphics? Where are the pictures? Where's the video? By the way, where's the audio that opens up the experience and trans really transforms legal education. Why didn't I think of that? That's a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> Absolutely. Once you're in the digital realm, you can link videos in. You can link audio in. You can link uh, simulations in. You can link Cali lessons. Mm -hmm. Those are pretty neat to attach to books and things like that. Absolutely. But I was, I was trying to, first of all, keep it under a half hour, but also stick to that which is relevant to what people understand today a book is. Because you start from where they are and you let them or they or, or you let the let the let, let the you move beyond that um, as people can sort of accept the change. But I completely agree that that would absolutely be part of it. Hold out the the vision. You don't have to do that. You can you can still take your text and move it into a digital environment. But expand their vision. The law school faculty seems in my limited experience, seems terribly focused on what we did yesterday or 20 years ago or 100 years ago, just fine for doing what we have to do tomorrow. But if you could just nudge them a little, and a few may actually say, you know, I think I'm going to be radical here and add something else, add pictures to my chapter, that will move them along. So. Sure. Well, well let, me, let me say, for 20 years I've been trying to get law faculty to radically change the way they construct their curriculum, and it doesn't work to excite them. I mean, I know, I know, all, the radical, I know all the radical law professors in the country, um, they can fill this room, um, or, or, or they want to do things that are even beyond, you know, wait, wait, you know, they want to, they want to do really complicated stuff that's, that's what I would call um, um, Self-programmed, you know, like very individualistic, expensive, mm -hmm. you know, and, they, and some of them want and got grants to do some really cool, amazing <coughs> things. Now, what a, what a lot of these projects didn't do was get permission to redistribute the results. Okay, and so they did their one-off. They can use it. Nobody else can because they didn't go through the intellectual property right. uh, uh, gauntlet and those things. And so. So, so in some ways, my goals are more modest so that we can bring everybody along. But my, my I would anticipate that absolutely we would want people to participate at, at all sorts of levels. Carl. So that's a very compelling vision of the future of the casebook, either you know, with audio or, or um, authors giving up their copyright, but getting a bounty payment. Are the raw materials that you need, bringing this back to law.gov, are those available today, or does government need to do something different in order to let you build on top of that? Not yet. Or I mean, they're, they're almost available. Your, your carball dump of last year was, was, a huge, was a huge step forward. But, um, but, uh, but that was only uh, the Fed subs, right? Um, I don't have the state Supreme Court cases. I don't have the district court materials. Um, I have a lot of the, uh, I mean, with LII, I've got US code. Um, but there's all sorts of other things. Um, as you saw in my little picture of a book, there's also law review articles that people want to take. Actually, what they want to do is go on the Nexus and just grab articles out of that and drop it in. I can't create a comment, uh, an article that's been grabbed out of Time Magazine or New York Times or something like that. Um, so that has to be dealt with, which is, which is to say, explain to the users in a way that either a sufficient 
fair use can be done, or you just don't build freely available stuff with that inside of it. It just becomes a link to the outside of that. Your name? Uh, Walt Palm from the Paul Brain Law Library. Hey, Walt. Uh, hi. Uh, do any of the existing course management software, like Twin and Blackboard, and there's a new one coming out, do they provide an opportunity to put stuff together in the way you described? No. No? There's a couple of prototype systems that are like uh, essentially book authoring systems, textbook authoring systems. And there's even a couple of startups, uh, Flat World Knowledge, um, and uh, the Institute of the Books got something called the SOPI Project. Um, but even that's, I think they're trying to, we, you know, we looked at that as well, but that's a, that's, we, we don't have to solve the hard technical problem here. If faculty want to write a book and get it to us in word format, we'll take care of all of the conversion. And we'll start by just doing it manually, and then as we ramp up, we'll build automated systems that basically, you know, you drop one format in, and out comes, you know, all the formats that you could possibly want. That little bit of the chicken and the egg thing, people are submitting stuff, and the kind of hope the rest of it comes to pass. It's absolutely a chicken and egg problem, right? But I'm hoping they can bribe people to, uh, <laughs> to participate. Yeah. But it's not, I mean, it, 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 it's not a bribe. I, I think the single biggest problem I have is, uh, is, is I'm, not, I'm not West, I'm not Aspen, I'm not Lexus. I don't mean the companies, but I mean the imprint of their presses. You know what I mean? And so I should start stop calling this e and start calling it e Langdell Press. So that, um, but but the but the problem is the people that really care about that already have case book contracts, so it's not like they're going to you know extract themselves from uh, one of those contracts and come to us. We actually have to go find all the people that don't already have case book contracts, and there aren't many of them left because the big three have been signing up everybody who wants to write a case book, giving them you know enough money or giving them at least the reputational points for doing it. I don't think there's a lot of people out there willing to write entire case books. So I, I either have to overpay or pay a lot of money, or I can get people to write chapters at a time. And chapters I thought would work, or I still think it might work, because I want people to select their either the class that they wish there was a better case book chapter for, or their favorite. You know, I really love teaching Rule Against Perpetuity, so I'm going to write the most awesomest Rule Against Perpetuities chapter ever. You know, and it's, and it's got my way of doing it, and I'll share that with everybody. And they can become the god of teaching rule against perpetuities. I don't know. Jerry? Yeah, John. One more. My understanding is that uh, the used book market is the real bane of, of uh, textbook publishing. And the, way to, the best way to kill used books is to produce <laughs> an electronic version. Which oh, a new version it. every every minute. Right. Um, <laughs> So why aren't the big three competing against each other in this domain? Um, is there some collusion there that, uh, that they don't want to, to invest in, in these technology because they're making plenty of money with the old? It would seem to be obvious that... Well, I'm sure they have a, a capital investment in their printing plants that they're amortizing, but that's, that's a, that was an old issue. Um, there, um, my estimate is that the market is about 100 million bucks for the legal education textbook market. Mm -hmm. um, about 20% of that's going to, and these are just pulling it out of my ass, frankly, but I, but after doing a lot of reading about other markets and things like that, 20% of that's going to bookstores, 20% of that's going to the printing costs, 20% of that's going to the, to the overhead, that's what you think, 20, 40, 60, there's 40% left, 35% uh, profit, 5% going to the authors, maybe 10%. Right? So if you do an e-version of that, you save the bookstore, you knock out the middleman, you save the printing cost, so you can drop the price 40% right there. Right. Right. So a $100 book becomes a $60 book instead. Typically, and though, it weighs, you, a whole, weighs a whole lot less. No, absolutely. But typically, though, you'll see that they'll price e-books at exactly the same or only 10% less. Um, you know, instead of $100, it'll be $90 or something like that. Um, and it's heavily DRM because they don't want to just sell one that becomes, you know, shared instantly with everybody else. 